All right, so here we're reading, we're starting off the, chap, the, the sermon here in Leviticus chapter number 5. Obviously it's Old Testament law, there's a lot of things here um, that don't exactly apply to us today. But there's one general theme that, that I want you to get out of this chapter. We're going to be turning a lot of different places this morning. But we see here that God holds people responsible for their sins. Right? And in this whole chapter, what it's, what it's mostly dealing with, if you didn't catch a kind of the overview of this chapter, is basically if you sin and you don't realize you're sinning, if you sin, what's called through ignorance, you're doing something that's wrong, but you don't quite know that it's wrong, you're still found guilty. God still holds you responsible for the sins that you do, even if you don't realize that it's a sin. I mean, you think about it, it's the same way that our government works today. You know, if you break a law, if you... If you trespass against somebody, if you do something, if you sit against another person, say you steal from them, or whatever, I mean, st stealing's pretty common sense. We all know that that's, I mean, that you could, you could guess there's going to be a law against that. But you can't use as justification saying, well, I didn't know that wasn't a law. The burden is on us in order to understand these things, at least within the state of Arizona. We need to know, we're supposed to know what the laws are. Now there's a million laws, and I don't think anybody knows what all of them are. But, see, God's got a lot fewer laws than, than man does. Man comes up with all kinds of laws. God has a lot fewer laws. And he's saying, here, look, if you do something and you sin, if you, you know, in, in these cases, too, he's saying, maybe you didn't even realize you did something. But as soon as you realize that, that you did that and that was wrong, he says, you're guilty. Now, God holds us individually responsible for our own actions. God does not hold us responsible for things that other people do. There's a, there's a teaching out there that teaches, it's a Calvinist teaching, it teaches on original sin. And what they do, and I've, teach, I've taught an entire sermon on this subject, just completely disproving it. But basically what they say, what people will say is that, well, because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, that basically we're all held responsible for Adam's sin. And that's just not true. And that's why people, you know, uh, the Catholics will baptize babies because they think that the baptism will help the, uh, save them from going to hell. And a lot of other religions do something similar because they think that without some kind of atonement for an infant, an infant's going to go to hell. And I don't believe that for a second. Little children don't understand the law whatsoever. They don't know anything about it. They don't sin. They're innocent. They're pure. And they go to heaven when they die. But there's this whole thing about original sin. But see, this is disproved. I'll disprove it real quickly here. Stay in Leviticus 5. I'll read from Deuteronomy 24 for, for you. Deuteronomy 24, 14 says, Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire... Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And see, in God's own law, he's talking about, look, you're going to be judged, you're going to be put to death. If you, if you commit a crime worthy of death, that falls on you and you alone. That does not fall on your children. It doesn't, if you're a child, it doesn't fall on you. Or a, 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 you know, a father, if your son does something wrong, you know, that, that punishment doesn't fall on you. If they do something that's guilty of death, it falls on them and them alone. And God holds us all individually responsible for our own sins. Look, we all have our own sins that we've committed, and God holds us responsible for it. And even if we didn't realize it was wrong, he still is going to hold us responsible for it. Now, that's all kind of groundwork for the main point of my sermon here. And the main point I want to, I want to point out here, look at verse number 5. Or verse number 4 of Leviticus 5 where we started. Look at verse number 4. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it. So as soon as you realize, hey, what I did was wrong, what I did was a sin, he says, then he shall be guilty in one of these, verse 5, and it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. And the title of my sermon this morning is Just Admit That You Are Wrong. <laughs> this is a problem that a lot of people have these days. People have a lot of pride. There's a lot, there's a lot of reason why people don't want to admit that what they've done is wrong. And honestly, this is a reason why a lot of people get out of church. 
At least a good church. A church that's going to teach you all of God's Word. See, we're a church. I'm going to teach you everything that the Bible has offered as to the best of my ability and the best that, that God's going to be able to use me to do this. I'm not going to hold anything back from you. If the Bible says that something is a sin, I'm going to tell you that it's a sin. A perfect example of this would be a teaching that has kind of gone out the window these days. The teaching is that the Bible teaches that if somebody gets divorced, they are not to get remarried. And that if you do get remarried, in God's eyes, you're committing adultery. And he says, if you get divorced, you're, you're, you're already causing your divorced spouse to, get, to commit adultery when they get married. And this is a teaching that's very clear from Scripture. Jesus Christ himself said it. It cannot be more clear. But see, a lot of churches aren't preaching on it. Why? Because there are so many people these days that are divorced. And nobody wants to hear, especially young people, a lot of people get divorced at a young age. And when you get divorced at a young age, you don't want to hear that, wow, I can't get married. Now, obviously, you know, there, there is a the stipulation where you get married after the death of your spouse because what, basically what it's teaching is that you know, when you make a vow and you're vowing to be with that person forever, it's until death do us part, right? That's the vow. So once that person dies, once your spouse dies, then you're free again, so to speak, to, to get married another time. So I'm married to my wife. I'm never going to divorce my wife. If my wife were to die before I die, our marriage has ended because she's no longer alive. And it's, mar it's ended in a, in, a, in, a right, in a rightful way because now that, that vow has ended, she's no longer here, and a widowed person is completely free to get married a second time. There's nothing wrong with that. In the case of divorce, when you get divorced from somebody, that see, in, in a sense, that marriage is still, still kind of stay. You're still bound by that vow because you vowed before God. Even if the state says this is disannulled, you know, you're no longer married, the vow that you've made before God is still in place. That marriage that, that you've when you've consummated that marriage, God has God sees that as saying, hey, that's a that's a lifelong thing. So even if you get divorced, you are not allowed to remarry according to the Bible. And this is a teaching that, and I don't have all the, all the verses on it handy. I, I just, I, it just came to my mind as one example of things that a lot of people don't even know. People don't even realize that's a sin. So oftentimes someone might get divorced and remarried and they've sinned through ignorance because they didn't know. They didn't know that that was a sin. They thought that it's just fine. You know, they went to church and their pastor said it's just fine and he married them and everything else. You know, and people get involved in these situations and it stems from not reading the Bible for yourself, first of all. Everyone needs to be responsible. Again, and that's why God holds you responsible. You need to be able to make sure that you read. Don't rely on the pastor. Don't rely on anyone else to tell you what's right and wrong. Rely on yourself and read the book and read it for yourself. But let's say you, that something like that has happened to you. It doesn't have to be, you know, that's just one example. That's an example a lot of people get angry about and upset about and, and will leave church over because they don't like it. Because, they, because why? They don't want to admit that they're wrong. They don't want to just say, that's what the Bible says, and if God said it, then I'm just going to believe it and I'm just going to listen to it and, and obey God. But the first thing he says here, when you realize, in verse 5, when you realize that you're guilty of one of these things, he says, then he shall confess that he hath sinned. God is so much more. See, in the Old Testament, you're going to see a lot of, of uh, sacrifices, right? People have to bring the, the various sacrifices for the sins that you commit to try to make an atonement. It's a blood sacrifice, and there's all these different laws and all these different things that you have to bring. But see, what God is most concerned with is your heart. The sacrifices were necessary. It's all a picture of, of Jesus Christ to come and, and to, to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world to, to wash away our sins and to pay for our sins. And there's a lot, of thing, a lot of symbolism, a lot of things to learn from the Old Testament in those laws. But ultimately what God is the most concerned about is your heart and, and your ability to be able to say, hey, look, I've sinned. I've done wrong. That takes a humble man to be able to say, you know what, I realize that what I do, because we all want to think that we're doing the right thing. Everybody does. And, it, you know, and the most common answer you get when you go out and talk to people, hey, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Almost everybody thinks they're going to heaven because they're a good person. 
I'm pretty good. You know, I haven't done anything that bad. I mean, I've never killed somebody. Right? I mean, that's really bad. But see, what they don't want to do is look at their own sins in the light of the way God views them. They don't want to say, like, you know what? What I did is actually really bad. It really is wrong. That lie that I told, oh, everyone lies. That's not that big of a deal. No, that lie that you tell, that really is a big deal. God has a punishment of hell on that lie. It's a serious, it's a serious thing. We have to be able to say and recognize and say, you know what? Yes, I am not that good of a person. The Bible says there is none that doeth good and sinneth not. There is none that is righteous. No, not one. We are not righteous because of our good deeds. The only way we could become righteous is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He was the one that lived the perfect life. He did everything right. And he's the one that came and took our sins upon him so that we can have life. We receive our righteousness through him. It's imputed unto us. It's given unto us as a free gift. We receive that righteousness, but we ourselves are not righteous. And people don't like to hear that. Look, this isn't positive preaching, right? You say like, oh man, I thought I came to church to feel good about myself. And now you're saying I'm a sinner and, you know, and, and, and it's terrible and everything else. I feel so bad. But look, you don't have to just feel bad. You should feel bad about what you've done that's wrong. The Bible says that godly repentance work at sorrow. Um, but see, the, the sorrow is good if you use it to change, right? See, the goal is not to just have a pity party for yourself and be like, oh man, I'm just so terrible, I'm a horrible person. The goal is to change. See, when he said, when you confess to God, he also wants you to forsake that sin. Whatever you've done is wrong. Look, recognize, it's good to recognize what you've done is wrong. And, he, and God wants you to confess and just say it. And just say, God, I'm sorry. Look, I've done wrong. I'm not right. I did wrong. But then you can move forward from there. See, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of positive things in the Bible too, right? But that's not what we're focused on this morning. So this morning we're focused on, on the negative things. So we're going to look at this. Um, Leviticus 26 is another chapter. You could turn it if you like. Leviticus 26, you're in chapter 5. Just flip over a few pages to 26, chapter 26. And just for sake of time, we're not going to read the whole chapter. But basically, the beginning of the chapter, he starts off saying, look, if you keep my commandments, basically, I'm going to bless you. He's going to give us rain. He's going to you know, you know, make your, your harvest bountiful. He's going to do all of these different things. You're going to, he's going to keep you safe and protected. And, and when the enemy comes, you know, you'll be able to chase, you know, one of you will be able to chase a thousand. You know, all these great blessings. Like, like you're, you're going to be protected if you do what's right. And then he continues on and he says, okay, if you choose not to follow my ways, if you choose not to obey my laws and my commandments, if you don't want to listen to me, then I'm going to curse you. And the curse is going to be severe. And he's saying that, you know, you're going to have famine. You're going to have pestilence. You're going to, you know, you're, the enemy's going to come and they're going to take you away into another land. You're going to go into bondage. And these are going to be the, the results of you not listening to me. But then look at verse 38. This is after he goes through all those bad things when you don't listen to him. For he starts off listening to all the good things. Probably, hey, listen to me. This is, it's going to be great. It's going to, it's going to be really well for you. I'm going to bless you. And if you don't listen to me, it's not going to be good. But after all the cursing, let's say, you, let's say you don't listen to God. You go through all that stuff. Look at verse number 38. The Bible says, And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me. So he's saying, look, if they're going to say, look, I've done wrong. Our fathers have done wrong. We've been taught wrong. Our fathers have done wrong. We've done wrong. And, and they confess that with their mouth and that they've walked, you know, we, we've done not what you've wanted us to do, God. Look at verse 41. And that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled. Right? Because you have to be humble it's in order to do something like that, in order to say you're wrong. You have to, you have to eat, you have to swallow your pride. You humble your heart. Their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and, then, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember and I will remember the land. He's saying basically, 
He'll forgive. I'll remember the covenant, but I, I want you to recognize that what you've done is wrong. And this is, this is the first step to salvation, right? Now, there's two things we could look at to, this morning. The first thing, just with salvation, the first thing you have to understand is that you're a sinner that, that deserves a punishment of hell. We've done wrong. We are not good enough to make it into heaven. If you don't understand that, then you don't need a Savior. If you don't realize that, that you are in a state where, where you are in your sins and that, and that you deserve a punishment of hell, you don't need a Savior. You don't need Jesus. I mean, you could, you could say you believe in Him all day long, but if you don't realize the state that you're in because of your sins, that's the first step. Once you realize that, then with a humble heart, you call on God and say, God, save me. <laughs> I'm not good. I'm not righteous. I need you to save me. And you call on God for that salvation. And you know what? God doesn't say, look at all the bad things you've done and just, and just berate you. He says, okay, I'll save you. And he says that he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. He says, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Praise God for that. And we're going to go into this a lot more tonight. Tonight's message is, is real tied in closely with what I'm preaching this morning. Tonight I'm going to be preaching about um, returning unto God. God forgets your sins. And he doesn't ask you to do and jump through all these different hoops and do all this work and do all this stuff. He just says, humble yourself. Believe. Just receive the free gift. And once you do that, you're forgiven. And that's great news. But see, there's also another aspect to this. That's salvation, right? That's our eternal life. That's, that's us being saved. There's also the aspect of our day-to-day -day life. Because sin still exists. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you no longer sin. Right? There's the new man that doesn't sin. But we go through our lives still in this flesh that causes us to sin. And God still holds us responsible. Now, He has removed the punishment of the lake of fire for our sins. That is no longer going to happen because we're His children. But the same way that my children will face punishment from me, if they break my laws and my commandments for them, is the same way that God is going to deal with us as His children. If we decide to say, you know what, God, I don't want have anything to do with you. Forget your law. I know that it says that, that if, if someone who's uh, divorced goes and marries someone else is committing adultery, but I don't care because I want to do this anyways, God. Guess what? God's going to deal with you appropriately because you have a hard heart, a stiff neck, and you don't want to listen to what God has to say and just submit yourself to his authority, and he will deal with you. But what he's saying here, he's saying, look, if you've done wrong, you've already done it, just Say you've done it. And the whole thing can end. And honestly, this could be a, a problem. You know, just admit that you're wrong. This is a problem even within interpersonal relationships. Right? You get in arguments, you get in fights with people. And, you know, it usually starts off because both people think they're right. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have a conflict, right? You say, I think I'm right, and you think you're right. And you have this fight, and this, you know, and... and Hopefully, somewhere along the way, someone will realize, you know what? I probably shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. But the reason why fights can, especially, you know, it's usually between like boyfriends and girlfriends, spouses, you know, when you have someone that you're really, really close with, the whole thing can end really quickly if someone can swallow their pride and just say, you know what? I was wrong. What I did was wrong. It's not, and this is exactly what God is looking for from us. He's saying, I just want you to admit that, that what you've done is wrong and, and just be sorry about that. And if we could need to be able to, to take our own life and our own interpersonal relationships and just take the time to say, you know what? I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to humble myself. It's not the easiest thing to do. But we see, especially, I mean, if you're wrong, I'm not saying that you just always have to apologize if you're not, even if you're not wrong. Right, we'll see, we'll see a good example of that. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 25. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip around in my notes a little bit here. Because some, some I've got a lot of verses that are, that are pretty much redundant. The, the Bible's teaching this over and over and over and over again. 
Acts chapter 25 is in the New Testament. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four Gospels, and then the book of Acts is right after that. I'll read a few of these verses for you just because, I mean, there's, this is so much in the Bible. Numbers 5, verses 6 and 7. Speak unto the children of Israel, when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit, to do a trespass against the Lord, and that, that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof, and add unto it the fifth part thereof, and give it unto him. So he says, you need to confess your sin that they've done. And in 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We all have sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, going back to my analogy of my children, right? Because as you're saved, you don't have to worry about that punishment of hell, but we do need to worry about the punishment from God as His child, as a discipline, as a form of punishment for things that we do that are wrong. Let's say, for example, my, my, I tell my daughter, you are not allowed to eat candy for a week. Whatever, right? That's my rule for it. I say, you know what? I don't want you. This is bad for you. You've had so much already. Christmas was come and gone, and you've just loaded up with all this stuff. I don't want you to have any sugar for a week. And then I see her the next day eating some candy, right? Guess what's going to happen? She's going to get a punishment. She's going to get discipline. But what if she says, Dad, I, I, I am so so sorry I've done wrong. I know this is, this is not right. I shouldn't have done this. She's still going to get a discipline, but I'm going to take it much easier when they, when they realize and say, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, and they can admit they're wrong, as opposed to, let's say, or say, well, I don't see why I can't have this. I mean, it's mine anyways. What do you mean I can't have this? You know, and starts mouthing off and have a rebellious, stubborn attitude and not willing to admit that what they did was wrong. They're going to get a much more severe punishment in that situation. Right? And this is the, the way that we need to remember with God just, re I mean, recognize what you've done, first and foremost. It doesn't mean you won't get any punishment whatsoever, but God is a merciful God, and God is looking to, to extend His mercy, and He really wants our hearts right with Him. The Apostle Paul, we're in Acts chapter 25. Look at verse number 7. See, Paul is a man of integrity. Paul is someone who's able to own up for the things that he's done. Paul is a man, if, you know, if you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, he started off before his name was changed to Paul, was Saul of Tarsus. Saul was a Pharisee, and he went around, he actually persecuted the church of God. He was an unbeliever. He was a Pharisee. He had a lot of zeal for his religion, but it was a false religion. It was a works-based religion. And what he did was he was seeking out people who believed in God and tried to shut down churches and imprison people that were doing God's work and was really contrary to God, right? But one day he got saved. You know, Jesus Christ appeared unto him. He went and talked to Ananias, and Ananias gave him the gospel. He believed on Christ. He got saved, and then he basically completely turned his life around and started working and doing things for God. And, and he forsook his old religion and started doing all this stuff for God. But see, God, or the Apostle Paul, what we see from Scripture is he's a man of integrity. He's someone who says, he admits, like, flat out, look, all those things that I did before, I count them but dumb. It was, it was worthless. It was nothing. He's like, I persecuted the church of God. I did all these things that were wrong. But he was able to man up and just admit, yes, what I did before was wrong. But now I'm trying to do what's right. Look at verse number 7 of Acts chapter 25. Because here we see another example. He's getting arrested all the time for preaching the Bible. He's going around and he's preaching God's word. He's preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. He's preaching the, the, the word of the Lord and getting in trouble for it. Because a lot of people don't like to hear the word. I mean, they, they crucified Jesus Christ. They put him to death. They didn't want to hear his teaching enough to kill him. Well, they were basically treating Paul the same way. Look at verse number 7 of Acts chapter 25. The Bible says, And when he was come... The Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. So it's bringing baseless accusations against Paul. They couldn't prove any of this stuff, but they're saying things against him. Verse number 8, While he answered for himself, Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. 
But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Conflicts will come in your life. And there will be times when you are completely right. And Paul was right in this situation, and he's not backing down. He's not going to sit here and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I won't do that again, because he had nothing to be sorry about. He had no reason to say, hey, what I did was wrong. He says, look, if I be an offender, if I've, if I've broken, because he knows he hasn't broken any laws, if I've broken laws, I'm here, put me to death. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to try to hide from it. I'm standing right here. I refuse not that punishment, but look, I haven't done anything wrong. So I'm going to fight this. So, the, you know, keep that in mind. Obviously, there's going to be people, there's going to be times when you, you get in arguments where sometimes one person's right and the other person's wrong. Sometimes both people are wrong, right? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, then, and then you should both be apologizing. Just because someone else apologizes, like if you're both wrong, then, then just both own up to the fact that you've done wrong and admit it. But if you haven't, if you honestly haven't done anything wrong, now, when you get in a, in a, in a heated conversation, some might call it an argument. I, I prefer heated conversation. It's a little bit nicer. But, you know, you get, you get a fight or an argument. You always think that you're right, but you have to be able to, to be temperate enough to, to try to take that outside view to see, like, is what I'm standing for really right? I mean, there's things from the Bible. It's like, look, I don't care how much... Here, here's a perfect example. And this is something that would be more serious, right? As the, as the husband, as the father of my family, I'm the head of the household. The God has ordained a certain authority given to me as the man in the house to make the rules and to make the decision maker. And that basically all decisions of the family is going to reside on my shoulders. It's a great responsibility. I, you know, again, I preach entire sermons about this, but it's the man's role. It's the man's job to do that. It's not a, a co-equal voting method where each person gets one vote and then when there's a tie, who knows what we do. God says, no, the authority has been given unto the man. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but this is the way that it is. And we can either accept the word of God or reject it. Now, if my wife were to say, you know what? Me and the kids aren't going to church. We're, just, we're not going to church anymore. And we started having an argument. I know that I'm right. I'm not going to back down and apologize and say, oh, well, okay, yeah, I guess you don't have to go to church just in order to, to make the fight go away. See, that's not the point. The point is to be able to say, if you're wrong, like, like in, this, in that situation, my wife should be able to say, yeah, you know what? I'm wrong. You're right. I mean, the, the God says this. The Bible says this. I need to be in church and I need to be listening to you and, and, and we're going to do this. Right? But if it's an argument over something really stupid, we're probably both wrong. <laughs> I mean, something that doesn't matter at all. There's like no bearing whatsoever. We need to be able to swallow our pride. And, and honestly, as with God, when you truly are wrong, when one person's right, one person's wrong, it helps the whole thing to just go away. When, one, when the person who's wrong can just admit it and say, I've done wrong. It, it works the same way. that we, I mean, we're made after the image of God. God designed things this way for us to be able to confess and say, yes, I've done wrong, God. And he's able to forget it and put it behind him and say, okay, fine, I forgive you. And it's the same route. Now, the person who's right, whether it be the, the, the man or the woman, whether it be what person A or person B, the person who's right ought to be able to also have the humility to be able to, to extend the forgiveness once the person has said that what they've done is wrong and not have to hold a grudge against that person and still just be like, well, you, you know, and keep bringing things up of how they were wrong even after, the, you know, once someone said, look, I've done wrong, I'm sorry, leave it at that. Don't rehash stuff weeks later or years later and just say, well, you did this. You know, it's done. We need to have this type of a forgiving heart also even if you're in the right, or especially when you're in the right. See, Paul, though, in this example here, he's not someone who's trying to make an excuse for his behavior either. Paul was doing what was right. He's preaching the word of God. 
There was no laws against it. He was doing everything right, and he's not going to make any excuse for his behavior. He's defending himself, but he's also not justifying any sin. The sin that he's done, he'd already recognized that. Not going to make any excuse for it. All he said was that he did it ignorantly in unbelief. But when he became aware that what he was doing was a sin, because he didn't quite know. He, he did it ignorantly. He even said he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He's not saying it wasn't a sin. He's not excusing it. But he's saying, once I found out, hey, I was wrong as a sin, then he said, you know, he did what's right. He, he believed on Christ. And that those things get put behind him and he's moving forward. There are people, turn if you would to Luke chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book of the, of the New Testament. We're going to see an example here of somebody who does try to justify themselves. Because this is an attitude we don't want to have. We don't want to just always be trying to justify ourselves when we're wrong and just coming up, grasping at strongs, just trying to, to come up with any reason why we're right and just can't let go of the fact that, no, you're wrong. Luke chapter 10, we're going to see a, uh, a story here of a man that approaches Jesus Christ. He asks him the question, he says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, of course, Jesus is extremely wise and he answers correctly. A lot of people will turn to this and try to say that, whoa, we need to be good in order to be saved. Look, there's an important reason why Jesus answers the way he does because he knows the heart of this guy that's asking him the question. But we'll get into that as soon as we read this, this story. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse number 25. Luke 10, uh, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, and of course he's a lawyer, right? It was, it was easy. He tries to justify himself later. But uh, in verse number 26, and he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. So nothing that Jesus said is ever wrong or inaccurate or incorrect. He's obviously always telling the truth. So he just asks him a question. He says, okay, well, what, what does the law say? How are you, you going to have eternal life according to the law? And he says, well... You know, you gotta love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, does anyone in here willing to say that you love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your being, everything about you is just completely loves God? I mean, 100%. I mean, think about that. If you love God with all of your mind, you are never going to be thinking something that's wrong. You are never going to have a bad thought. If you're loving God with all of your heart, you are never going to be lusting after something that you shouldn't be lusting after. So can anyone say they honestly love God with all of their heart, all of their mind? I, I don't think so. I don't know. I haven't met anyone that can say that. And he says, and thy neighbor is thyself, which means you're not doing anything wrong or bad at all ever to anybody else. That's what the law teaches. And this is a summary of the law. And Jesus says, yep, you've answered right. This do and thou shalt live. See, the problem with the law is that nobody can keep the law. The problem with the law is that we're all transgressors of the law. We've all broken the law. Nobody can keep that. Jesus was the only one that was able to keep that. But it's a true answer. I mean, hey, look, theoretically, if, if there is a person that is able to keep the entire law as Jesus did, you will not go to hell. You will go to heaven. You, because then you wouldn't be a sinner. Except nobody can do that. So look at what it says here in verse 29. So Jesus answered. He, said, oh, he knew the right answer. He said, yep, do everything perfect. Jesus said, or, uh, uh, but his response is here after Jesus said he's, he's answered him right. Verse 29, but he willing to justify himself. See, he already knew that he was wrong. And instead of saying, well, Jesus, I, I can't do those things. Instead of saying, I've already failed at that. I've already broken that. God, I, I, save me. He says, no, I'm going to justify what I've done. But he willing to justify himself said on Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
He knows he's done wrong to people in the past. So you say, well, wait a minute, who's, who's my neighbor? Let's define my neighbor. If it's only this specific people, if it's only my, my father or my mother, like, like, is that my neighbor? Okay, well, yeah, I haven't sinned against them, so I'm good. And he wants to justify himself because he knows he's done wrong to other people. So he's just trying to find and nitpick and find this, this way where I can justify what I've done and say, well, see, what I've done isn't quite wrong because they're not my neighbor. But Jesus answered him, and then he goes and, and he gives the, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? So uh, we'll read it here, verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So he explained here, look, these are both people here that he explains. The priest and the Levite are supposed to be like men of God. They're doing the Lord's service. They were looked upon as people doing God's work. And they see this guy that got beat up and left for dead in the ditch. They don't even, they don't want to dirty their hands. They walk over, they just cross on the other side. Yeah, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to walk on the other side of the street and keep going. I'm going to go about my, I'm busy. But a certain Samaritan, verse 33, and see, Samaritans important because the Samaritans were looked down as like a lower class person. They were looked down as, as the low people to the Jews. The Jews had their genealogies and, and they were real proud of their heritage. And the Samaritans, they had mingled their blood with the heathen. So the Samaritans was like, you know, they, they were not a full-blooded Jew. So they were looked down upon. But he says, and that's why he uses this person example, because you got the two people that are looked up and respected to. And then you have this a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, verse 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. So he goes out of his way to do everything he possibly can to help this person. You know, whatever it was that he was doing, he puts on hold. He says, man, this guy needs help. This guy needs it. You know, he brings him to, he puts him on his own beast so that he walks and that this guy doesn't have to walk. I mean, the guy's been left for dead. Brings him to the hotel and, and he cleans up his wounds. He tries to get him, you know, back to health. And then he leaves money with the, with the keeper of the hotel saying, look, take care of this guy. Here's some money for right now. Whatever it takes to get him back on his feet again, just do it and I'll pay you when I come back. That's great compassion, right? There's someone who loved his neighbor. And then Jesus, of course, asks him, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. So, Obviously, there's no justification with God's law. You can't, you can't make an excuse for your sins. We, we, and we ought not to try to do that with ourselves. And that's most common what people do because you don't want to admit that you're wrong. It's the attitude of the Pharisees to justify their own sins. The Pharisees were hypocrites. Jesus Christ railed against them. And he's saying, you know, thou hypocrite. And he, he, he went on in uh, Matthew chapter 23, I believe it is. See, 23 or 25. And, and just went on this whole tirade against the Pharisees, just calling them, you know, hypocrites, whited walls, their sepulchers. He said, you know, like, like, you're full of dead men's bones. Why? Because they would teach one thing and they would do another. Their hearts weren't right. They just wanted to look like they were doing well. They, they wanted to look like they were so righteous. And uh, they loved the long prayers and the, the best room at the feasts and all these other things. They just liked the admiration of men. Because men would look to them as being so holy and so righteous, but they themselves wouldn't do any of those things that they taught. In Luke 16, I'll just read this for you. Verse number, turn if you would to, um, to Proverbs chapter 28. I want you to see that, Proverbs 28. If you open up your book, Bible in the middle, you're going to find a book of Psalms. Right after the book of Psalms is a book of Proverbs. Dead centers is the book of Psalms, real close to it. And right after Psalms of Proverbs, Proverbs 28. Luke 16, verse 14, the Bible says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Talk about Jesus Christ's teachings. They hear what Jesus Christ is teaching, and they were covetous. They, they love money. 
So they derided what Jesus was saying, and he said unto them, this is talking about Jesus Christ, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. So Jesus answered him and said, You know what? You're always trying to justify yourself in other people's eyes, but God knows your heart. And remember that with your own sin. You could try to justify yourself in front of other people. You could try to give, and a lot of people do this, they'll squirm around and try to explain, oh, why did I did is not a sin. And you might be able to convince some men. You might be able to convince other people and say, oh, okay, yeah, well, I guess you weren't wrong then. But God knows your heart. God knows what you've really done. No lies or whatever you try to tell to cover up what you've done here that might work against men. It's not going to work against God. You hear me? Girls, God knows your heart. You might be able to get away with lying about things to your parents. You might be able to get away with lying about things to other people and they'll believe you. But God always knows. Was I tell you that last night? God always knows when we do wrong. You cannot fool God. We can't hide our sins from God and we shouldn't just try to, to cover them up and, and secretly just keep doing them, right? Just because you can get away with something doesn't mean it's right. Proverbs 28, look at verse number 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. God doesn't want us. He said, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to hide your sin, just, just cover them and just push them, you know, these are my sins. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep them over here so just out of public view. No one sees my sins. And I'm going to keep doing those things. He says, you're not going to prosper. He says, but if you can just say, just confess them and forsake them. So you know what? I've sinned. God, I sinned. I'm sorry. I've done wrong. And I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> they are what they are. They, I've already done them. They're in the past. But God, please have mercy on me. And he says, you will have mercy if you can just have that humble attitude towards God. God ultimately wants our hearts right. Um, I'm going to go into Jeremiah 3 tonight, so I don't think I'm going to cover that this morning. Most of what the sermon is about is about being right with God when we wrong Him, because that's the most important. Right? God's the most important. And, our, and, and getting our sins out of our life is most important. But I also touched on, um, you know, when we do wrong to other people and when we get in arguments and stuff, we should also be able to admit that. Turn if you would to James chapter 5. It's right near the end of the, of the New Testament. James chapter 5. There's a verse in James chapter 5 that actually a lot of, like the Catholics will try to use this verse to, to say, to justify why you need to go and confess your sins to a priest, right? Because uh, if you're familiar with the Catholic religion, what they have is they have a confessional booth. And that's the place where you're supposed to go when you've sinned and confess your sins to another man and just tell him all the bad things that you've thought and all the bad things that you've done and, and all, just, just lay all your dirt on him and supposedly he's supposed to, to tell you how you can make that right with God, which is completely false. We don't need, you know, Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. Amen. The man Christ Jesus. We don't need another man to absolve our sins. We don't need a man to tell us what you need to do, you know, to get right with God. Hey, it's all, it's, first of all, it's all found in the Bible and you can go directly to God. You can confess your sins to him directly. But this verse that we're going to read in, in James chapter 5, this isn't talking about you sinning against God. James 5 verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray, for, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Confessing your faults one to another is when something is your fault. Right? My bad. I did something wrong to you. So when I do something wrong to you, I'll confess that what I've done to you is wrong. If I pull out of the parking lot and I bump into Brother Sebastian's car and you know, leave a big old dent or tear off his bumper and then take off, 
hey, he might not know who did that, but I should be able to say, hey, it was my fault, I did you wrong, and be able to confess that to him. The Bible tells us here, we ought to be able to confess our faults. And, you know, basically, you know, apologize when you're wrong, right? The Bible doesn't use the word apologize. But when we confess our faults to another, what you're doing is you're saying, you're confessing and saying, what I did was wrong. And that will help, especially within the church, but, but in all of your relationships, it helps those relationships to be able, for someone to be able to say, what I did was wrong. And to confess your fault unto them. Because everybody will move forward. The person who's right will appreciate that. I'm sure he would appreciate that. To say, you know what? Because maybe, what if he saw me and then I just denied it, right? That's going to cause a huge problem. Now, especially as a pastor, I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a major problem. But <laughs> let's just say I wasn't even a pastor, you know, but I was just some random person. You know, I do that. That's, I mean, that's going to cause a problem between us for a really long time, as opposed to someone just saying, hey, I did this. I mean, I've done that to someone else before. I was in a parking lot. We had this big truck, and it was lifted, and there was this little tiny, like, hybrid, I don't remember what it was, one of those, it was a Yaris or something, like one of those little tiny things. And we have this big lifted truck. It's got a hitch, and I'm backing out. I can't even see this car. So I back out, and, I, and, and I, I, the, the, the hitch hit the bumper, and of course, those things are designed to just like completely crumble and, and crack and, and just be destroyed on touch. So, <laughs> and we had this big steel truck. So I back up, but okay, I saw it like, like and I, literally, I was going maybe one mile an hour if that. I was going back up real slow and the thing just, 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 just destroyed this bumper. But the right thing to do is to say, hey, you know what? I don't even know who that person is. So I went into the building and just said, you know, hey, who owns this vehicle? I, I, you know, sorry, I backed up into it. Confessing your fault. Because, why? Because I did wrong. Why? Because I'm willing to own up to the things that I do that are wrong. And we, and we ought to have that. And you know, I'm not trying to lift myself up here and say, look at me, I'll go great. No, it's just an example. I mean, it's a stupid thing anyways. I mean, it was not that big of a deal. That's a minor issue. But see, a minor issue like that can turn into a major issue overnight when you don't treat it appropriately, when you can't just humble yourself. I mean, if someone would have saw me do that and then I take off, now all of a sudden there's, hey, you've damaged someone's property, you left the scene, you, you know, and all this other stuff, and it turns into a much bigger issue than if you would just deal with it right up front. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll close on this, Luke chapter 19. We'll close on this verse. It's, we're basically done. I've got, I've got all the, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, Hopefully I'm not being too repetitive. But we need to make sure that we, that we get, these, uh, we get this, this, this down. It's a real simple concept. It's real easy. It's not, it's not, it's not difficult. We're not, you know, we're not going into some major theological study this morning. It's a simple principle, but it's one that's really important. It'll help you out throughout your life. We're going to see an example here of someone who did the right thing with Zacchaeus. If you know the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was, uh, I always remember this story just from, from when I was a kid going to Sunday school. There was a little song about him because he was, he was small of stature. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. And I don't remember the way the whole song goes. He climbed up the tree because he couldn't see Jesus because he was real short. So like he climbed on his tree and Jesus was coming. Jesus called him down. Well, here, we'll just read the story. Luke 19, verse number two. We'll read, we'll read the real story instead of me trying to sing the kid's song that I don't remember from 30 years ago. <laughs> Luke 19, verse number 2. He did the right thing. Jesus, or Zacchaeus was a sinner. It says in the Bible, he was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. He was a tax man. Nobody likes a tax man. And the tax man in those days were, were, were corrupt usually too. I mean, they would, they would tax people for things that, you know, it wasn't right. And they would, they would get a lot of, they would basically extort money from people. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 19, verse number two. So la the last scripture we're going to look at tonight, tonight, or this morning. <clears throat> the story of Zacchaeus. Verse number two says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. He was a short guy. There's a lot of people there. You couldn't see Jesus. Verse number four, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass that way. 
And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. So Jesus sees him up in the tree and he calls him down and he says, look, I need to go, I'm going I'm to stay with you today. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. So Zacchaeus receives him. He's saying, great, you know, Jesus is coming to my house. He receives him. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And see, all the people are like, oh, you know, these are the Pharisees, right? They see Jesus Christ going to, to, to eat with someone who's looked on as despised. And he is a sinner, right? I mean, this guy has, has done wrong. And everyone's like, oh, I can't believe he's talking to that person. And like, we ought never to have this attitude. Oh, I can't believe he's talking to that person. Why? You think because you're so righteous? Now, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he even says, you know, they that be whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. You know, he came to call the sick people. He came to the sinner. He came to go and reach the lost and reach the people that needed him the most. And Zacchaeus needed him. So he's not worried about what other people are going to think about him talking to him because he's trying to help him out. He's trying to do right by him. It says in verse 7, And when they saw it, they all murmured. I read that already. Verse number 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day of salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus put his faith in Christ. That's what saved him. So don't get confused by the story. But he had the attitude of, upon his salvation, of wanting to make things right. He was, he was trying to own up for what he did. So he's saying, look, if, if I've done wrong, if I've defrauded people, I'm going to restore four times as much. I'm going I'm I'm to do what's right. I'm going to give it back to him. And, he, and he's trying to, to now confess and forsake his sins. He knows, he, I mean, everyone knew he's a sinner, but here we see a changed man, a changed life. Someone who's decided to, to, to not only be saved, which I mean, taking salvation is easy. You take a free gift. But we ought to be striving to be a changed person, to do what's right. And, and the first step in doing what's right is being able to admit what I was doing was wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. I mean, a drug addict or an alcoholic, they have to be able to admit that this isn't good for me. You know, like, because a lot of them just say, well, I want to do this. I want to keep doing it. And as long as a person wants to do it, they're going to keep doing it. And with our sin, you might be able to say, yeah, but I want to do it. And when you want to do something, you justify it. I remember when I was, when, when I would, when, uh, I don't know if you call me an alcoholic or not, but I was really heavily into drinking quite a bit. There was always an excuse to, to, to have a drink. Always. It's always somebody's birthday. It's, all, it's Friday. It's Wednesday. It's what, I mean, what, I mean, you could, if you want a reason to do it, if you want a justification, you can do it. Oh, well, it's, I mean, there was this wedding. So, you know, I, I know I said I was going to stop drinking, but it was this wedding. I mean, this, what am I supposed to do? It's stupid. Okay, that's justification for your own sin. Don't do that. Instead of just saying, you know what, this is wrong. I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to get rid of this. Confess and forsake. Let's bow our eyes and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us all uh, when we find ourselves in a sin, that we would have the humility to, to be able to say that we're sorry, to be able to, to confess it as a sin, dear Lord, to be able to confront it and say, yeah, God, it really is a sin, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Dear God, help us to have that type of a humble attitude that we wouldn't be lifted up in our own pride. And also, dear God, in our own, in our own dealings with people, when we realize that what we've done is wrong, that we would be able to swallow our pride enough to say that, yes, we are wrong, and be able to confess our faults one to another, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us have this proper attitude, and with this proper attitude, dear Lord, be able to, to move forward and um, be able to put all the, all the problems behind us, especially the problems we have with you, dear God. We love you. We thank you for being so loving and forgiving and merciful unto us, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.